of certain cases I want to talk about. Um, okay, so I'm going to explain to you about animal communication, what it is, what it's for, how it works, and all that, all that stuff. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to, to talk to you about um, is that it's a fact that animals have thoughts and feelings. So that's the first premise. They all have thoughts and feelings, and they have consciousness. So they have the same type of consciousness as we have. It's just that it's not creative consciousness, but they are, they are conscious the same way as we, we are. So I'm insisting on this because in certain areas people think that animals have no thoughts and feelings. So it's difficult to make them believe in animal communication if they don't believe they have thoughts or feelings. So they have the same range of emotions as we have. Exactly the same. They go for the same emotions uh, according to situations or events or relationships with their guardians. Hello. So, so the range of feelings goes from the same, same as us, joy, happiness, um, sadness, grief, resentment, um, especially when you, when, you, when, you, when you go away. Uh, sometimes it can go into guilt, uh, many types of emotions, the, uh, the same as we have, exactly the same range of emotions, okay? Um, so what we're going to do with animal communication is that um, we pr I project my spirit to the spirit of an animal and in doing so I receive information that comes in the form of images, of thoughts and of sensations. And those sensations, they can be physical sensations, like I can feel things as if I'm touching them, or they can be emotional sensations. Okay? Now when, you, when, I, when I do animal communication, it's incredibly real, it's just as real as, as this will. So if I'm, if I'm projecting my mind to a horse or to a cat or to a dog, to me it's just as real as I see you. I see them the same way, it's just as precise, okay? Even if I just start with the base of a picture, it's just as precise. So I can feel them, I can see them physically, I can feel them, and I can get the emotions. And I, I receive information, okay? So how does this work? Um, the way it works is because we, we, assume, we, we assume the fact that, that we are all connected and that everyone is connected inside a quantum field. So the way it, it works is that I extend my consciousness to the consciousness of an animal and I, I call it projecting my spirit to the spirit of an animal. But it's really as if I were extending my consciousness and in doing so my, my consciousness is linked to that of the animal and I'm, it's as if I'm talking with the animal. I get, I receive information. So it's not the same as psychic. A psychic is someone who is going to perceive things. A psychic is going to have a picture or have a person in front of them and they're going to pick up. They're going to feel an aura, they're going to get uh, images of the past, images of the future, images of things going on. Um, they're going to get uh, thoughts, words, things, those type of things. That's someone who's doing psychic work. So I know they call it psychic communication with animals, but it's because the American editors wanted me to put the word psychic. But it's really, I don't use the word psychic so much because it's really animal communication. It's a, it's a dialogue. It's the same as if I was talking. If I was talking with you and we would get together and we would say, oh, let's meet and have tea at five o'clock. And we would talk about the things we do in our life. And you would talk to me about your family, maybe about the children, about things you've experienced in the past. You would talk to me and I would get to know how to learn, to learn how you are. I would get to know you and we would exchange. This is exactly the same thing. That's why I don't call it a psychic. It's not psychicness, it's animal communication. Of, and granted, it goes a little bit in the psychic field because you have to develop those perceptions to be able to do it, okay? So wh when, you, when you project your spirit to the spirit of an animal, then you connect, you're with him. You're just like with him. You see him, you feel him, you understand him, and you get all this information which then you translate into words into your language, which would be English when I'm here, or French when I'm over there, <laughs> Spanish when I'm in Spain. It's translated into a language that we, we can understand. But that information comes in the form of thoughts, w just or words, images, pictures, and feelings and sensations. Okay? Yes, on that it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's clear? Mm -hmm. So it's really about, again, just to sum up, it's just about consciousness extending and reaching the consciousness of another animal and linking together and just like they say here, hanging, we're hanging and we're exchanging information, okay? So, um, wh why, do people, why do people call? Why do they call for animal communication? They usually call when they have a problem. <laughs> like a cat is peeing all over the place, that's a classic <laughs> one. Uh, a dog is destroying the house. 
uh, a horse is not doing the type of things that they want the horse to do. Um, a case of e euthanasia or pre-euthanasia usually is, is my animal ready to go or not ready? Uh, what, do I, what do I do? Um, cases of also of when there's various animals in the home and they're not getting on, people want to know what's going on, or an animal not getting on with a member of the family, that can also happen. Many, 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 there's all types of possibilities of situations, jealousy, um, anything, things that will happen with human beings. They have problems, something is going on. And usually the, the, the guardian, which is the human being, can't figure it out. They have no idea what's going on, they don't understand it. Okay? The reason why they don't understand it is because the guardian is not using the same language as the animal. That if they were using the same language, they would understand what's going on. Because the animal communicates with thoughts and feelings, okay? Whereas we communicate with words, with language. And it all goes through this very strong mental process. But the thing is, so we make everything go through this mental process of in understanding everything intellectually. And we're not capting, we're not, get, we're not grasping the language of the animal, which is thinking, feeling, okay? And because we're not grasping, therefore we don't understand. So the only things we do understand is yes, when they're meowing at the door to say they want to come in because they're hungry, or when they, they show us love, or they, they show us emotions, we understand those things because that's very, very obvious. But then the other non-obvious stuff we don't grasp because we're just not using the same language. So it's as if we're in two different spaces and we're living together. And we're just living next to each other, but we don't really understand each other. Like people do. <laughs> people live together and they don't understand each other. Same thing. So we can go a whole lifetime with an animal and we don't really, really know who the animal really is. We don't understand the insights, the, 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 the inner being. Okay? So communication, it helps you to, and that's why I teach it, so people really are able to grasp the real inner being of the animal, who he, how he, he experiences his life. Because you can never know that because you're always seeing your animal through your human eyes through your experiences and what you think they should be doing and what you think they should be acting. But you don't know how they're feeling inside. So a very good example of this is, is someone that I'm very fond of and she just got a puppy <laughs> who's a very wild puppy. And that puppy happens to belong to a certain breed of animals that comes from Spain, that they're very wild and they're hunting dogs. And she would like, Moira knows who I'm talking about. So she would like the dog to be one of a doggy doggy, cute doggy pie. But she's trying to change the dog into a doggy pie, and that doesn't work. Because this is a wild, this is a dog with instinct, very high instinct because of his breed, and a hunting instinct, an incredible, uh, complete heightened sense and senses. Very, very heightened senses, much more than a normal dog. And, and a very sharp mind, and very fast, and it corresponds to the way that dog is. So you can't take a dog like that and try to turn it into a cute doggy that's going to sit on the sofa and do things when you ask them to and get a treat. It doesn't work that way. You have to understand the nature of the animal. So this is a, uh, animal communication is also about respect. It's also about understanding the animal, who he is, respecting them, respecting their nature, and not trying to mold them into what we want for of them, or what we think they should be doing. Okay? I think that's really important because it's part of their language. And they always come to us. You know, they always come to us with the unconditional love and we need to go towards them and understand who they really are. Each one individually is very different, okay? So when, when we give the workshop of animal communication, I, I teach you the, the, the basics of being able to really communicate with a, a very precise technique where you are most people, almost really 95% of the people in the class, by Sunday they can communicate. So I always explain, it does, it doesn't mean you're going to run a marathon because you just learned it, but at least you know how to communicate and you can understand your animal. That's, that's the most important thing. Um, and you're going to learn the diff another type of language, which is the language that we, we call, that is usually called telepathy, but I call it telepathy empathy. Okay, it goes together. Because telepathy is usually only transfer of thoughts. And here we are not doing only transfer of thoughts. We're perceiving and we're giving and we're using empathy because we're using all our senses. And specifically women uh, tend to know more the language of empathy than the language of telepathy. And empathy works perfectly fine because through empathy you can also get images and sensations and feelings that can be incredibly accurate, incredibly accurate. So um, 
so I show I show you how to, to work with that type of language so that you can you can use it and you can communicate with it, with your animals. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you about a few a few cases um, and, and how how it works and what can happen. Um, so we're going to start with cases that are a bit more simple and then we'll go into a bit more complex. So a type of case that is a, a bit more simple would be just understanding what's going on in the mind of an animal and why there's an issue just by understanding him same as if let's say you spoke with a person and you would say um, well why did you do that why did you mess up your exam or why did you why did you get scared that day or what, what happened to you and the person might not know exactly what happened to him but he'll start talking which will be able to help you to understand why he, he failed at the exam or he, he was fearful the other day or something he had emotions because he'll talk to you about his emotions. Okay, so this is a case I um, I, I did for a horse. Um, this was a horse of the the, the top um, Spa French um, jumping team, Michel Robert. He's very very famous. He's like the star in France, and his horse, um, the, which is the horse that had a physical healing that's described in the book with the, the jaw broke, um. and the, I, that's that's the same horse. Um, and there was something, so prior to the accident, um, he, so they, they could take them in these big vans to go to competitions. So the horse was very anxious in the comp to get to the competition, and that's actually how he broke his jaw, because he was going up and down with his head, because out of anxiety, so he rammed his head on, on one of the balls, and when I saw him, which when we got the miracle, which from above, that his jaw was broken in two, with a piece hanging out like that, and blood all over the place, it was disgusting. Pieces of flesh all over. And everyone was fainting except me. <laughs> well, maybe everyone was white. Um, so we were given a miracle that day to, to heal that horse. But pr so prior to that accident, the, 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 the man, Michel Robert, asked me, um, I can't understand what's going on because just before every obstacle, there's a problem. This is a horse who has incredible abilities. He's one of the top um, jumping horses. I mean, take into account that those horses are like a million euros each horse of these, these top star jump, jumping teams. And I, I can't understand because when we, when we, before the competition, he's fine, everything's going fine, he's jumping everything at a very high level. And I get to the competition, and it, he always has something happening just before we get to the obstacle. So he, he either he stops, or he doesn't quite make it, and he starts going into in this anxiety mode. So he didn't understand what was going on. So I do the communication, and w what, what, we, what I found out is that the horse, because they're so perceptive, they're so telepathic, they, they pick up on everything, everything you're thinking, everything you're feeling. So the man, obviously, he's the top star in France, so he has to keep up his reputation. He has to keep up being the top star in France. He doesn't have to, but he doesn't want to give up his, his position. Um, and he's already in his 60s, which normally, normally no one gets to that age in, in those teams. Um, he's, instead of, he, he has the ability, that's how he got to that very high level, he has the ability to connect his mind to the mind of the horse and to kind of hold him with his mind. Because these are high tension horses. These are horses that, to be able to do those, all those obstacles and all those high level competitions, they're very, very fiery. They're very hyper, okay? I remember once when I was in, in, um, in one of those stalls and the, 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 all the horses of the French jumping team, the national French jumping team, they all came in and like, oh, yeah, you know, that. it's like <laughs> la massa, like the muscles, the necks, like that. Most of them are stallions and they were snorting. I mean, the energy is, wow, when you, I mean, you're really scared when you're in front of them. They're not cute little things. They have incredible strength. Okay, that's how they, that, that's their athletes. They're like, they, they're basically like baseball, like basketball players. They're real athletes, they're really trained in amazing condition. So now to be able to manage horses like that and to reach a very high level, um, uh, top riders usually they have, either they dominate the horse completely or they have the ability to connect their consciousness to the consciousness of the horse and hold him with their mind. So this man, Michel Robert, he has that. He doesn't dominate the horses, and he has that gift, okay? Now what happens is, when he's on the, on the ground of the competition, his own anxiety starts kicking in, and he starts projecting his mind to all the next obstacles. So what happens is he's not in the present anymore, okay? Because he's projecting, I don't know if anyone here is an artist, but anyone who's done stage, 
anyone here has done the stage? Mm -hmm. No, musician? Uh, yes. I yes. So anyone who's done that, you know that you have to project your mind. You have to be in the present, but you have to project your mind to the next thing. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. So that you're prepared for the next either musical theme or something. But if you project too much forward, then you're stuck because then you're not in the present anymore. It's a very difficult balance that you have to have. So for horse riders, it's a very difficult thing to have. They have to be able to be in that present mode, but able to f uh, project what's happening next without being their next. Because if they are in their mind in the next place, the horse is in his mind in the next place too. Because they follow what's going on in your mind. They react to your pictures, your emotions, your thoughts, to everything you're feeling and thinking. So he was projecting with anxiety his mind in the future, and therefore the horse was couldn't do the stuff that was right up front. So he was messing up. So when I explained this to me to Michel Robert, he said, I get it. He completely knew what I was talking about, because these are people that are intelligent and they think things through. They have to. If not, they can't be at that level. And so he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to really apply this for the next time. He applied it the next time, and he just, he won all the competition. Mm -hmm. oh. Which This is a top rider who usually wins a lot of stuff, but he was having a lot of trouble with this horse. And I explained to him the anxiety, and I explained to him why the horse had had that accident in the van on the way back, because they had messed up, and he was angry. He was angry with the horse because they, he didn't want to be angry, but he was still angry because they messed up and everything went, went off. That caused a lot of anxiety, and then you add on top of that a lot of traveling in vans and a lot of stress for the horse. That's why he had the anxiety, and he was bobbing his head up and down, and they had the accident. Oh. So communication can, can help d define r subtle things. This is a very subtle. I'm starting with a very subtle example. Usually I start with more obvious things. But it's kind of, a, of, of an interesting case. It's very, very subtle. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is to show you um, about our mind. So the reason why <coughs> I'm talking about this is so that you understand that everything you think and everything you feel and everything you are is picked up by your animal. They get everything and so if you're thinking you're hiding you can't because they get the under of the under of the under of the under you see even stuff that you think that you've you're done with they get it and it's very interesting because because of that a lot of reactions that you don't understand that people happen to people like the horse is going to kick the dog is going to snap the cat is going to pee <laughs> things like that <laughs> That makes me laugh, the pink cat yeah. once. Um, <laughs> it's kind of my favorite thing <laughs> to do. It's not very funny. When it's it's not funny for the yeah. person, but for yeah. me it's kind of funny. <laughs> because I usually know what's going on. But it's not funny to have cat pee in the house. Not funny. But it's usually because something underneath is happening. Something deep that you might not be aware of. So I'm going to give an, an example of okay, Let's go into cat pee because okay. it's the subject. And then I'll tell you a nice story about another cat. Um, Cat pee for, okay, so this was a cat, I think there might be that story in the book. I have a million cat pee stories. <laughs> I could write another book on that. Um, this was a woman that she was engaged with a guy. I was in, in France, north of France, in Alsace. She was engaged with someone, I forgot to turn off my cell phone. Let's hope it won't ring. Um, and she didn't really, really want to marry the guy. So she had, she had uh, concerns, but she didn't tell me. Okay, so, okay, I meet her. She comes to a workshop and she says, I have a real problem because the cat is peeing in front of the bedroom. So she was, I said, so who do you live with? So I live with my companion and I'm engaged, but we're not marrying. We, 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 we probably, we're due to marry. That's how she put it. That's all she told me. And she said, well, the cat is peeing right in front of the bedroom. And so when, when we opened the bedroom, uh, in the morning and walk out, <laughs> my ex, my future husband, not the ex, puts the foot right in the big um, poodle, pod, puddle? Puddle. puddle, not poodle, puddle of, of pee pee. So she was very upset and he was getting really upset because he was he wanted to get rid of the cat and she loves, she happens to love the cat so that made a lot of tension. So I do the communication and I say, I, I, I go into the depth and I tell her, I say, okay, the, there is an issue with the relationship here. That's the reason why the, the cat is doing PB. The cat is fine. The cat has no, uh, no problems. The cat has no urinary infection. Everything's fine. But what's happening is that you have a lot of uh, hesitation, of doubts about this relationship and about marriage. 
and it's causing a lot of tension for you because he's putting the guy was putting pressure to get married. She didn't quite want it because she felt that he had a dominating um, dog, kind of dogmatic personality, and she never dared to speak up. And she was aware that she didn't dare to speak up, but she wasn't able to to do it. So I explained her, to her, I said, what's happening is the cat is expressing the depth of your emotions. The depth of your emotions, because she, even, that, she wasn't even aware that she wasn't expressing it. Okay, because this is France. In America, people are a little bit more, well, I shouldn't say that, it's going to be on, t on t YouTube. But she wasn't aware, she just, um, she was in the relationship, she was caught up with it. She knew she had doubts, and she knew she had, was thinking about it, but she wasn't really quite aware that, that she had so much, things, emotional things going on about it. So we talked about it, we had a long talk after that, after the workshop, we got together and I spoke with her and we went over the whole the history of the cat, we talked about the relationship and the next day that was it. No more pain. <laughs> that was it. So why? Why is it like that? For some strange reason that I cannot fathom, I have no idea why cats do that. But cats so it, it doesn't mean it has to be that. It could be ter territorial, it could be urinary infection, it could be environment. I'm not saying that all the cases are like that. I'm talking about that case. But for some reason, they tend to express unexpressed emotions. And it comes out in the form of, of pee. And whenever, the minute it's the woman is conscious of what's going on, finished. They don't have to do it anymore. Now, why do they do that? I don't know. Because it's not very amusing the cat pee, it just makes everything worse, but maybe, I just think, I would say it's a cathartic effect. They're bringing out everything, and everyone gets angry because it stinks and it's horrible, and I, I suppose, I don't know, maybe there's some mysterious soul reason that I don't know about, why they do that. But I know that cats, specifically cats, do that. But all animals act out what's going on inside of us. All of them. So. Not only do they pick up on everything that we're, we're thinking and feeling and, act and doing, but they can also act out stuff that's going on for us. And usually what's acted out is stuff that we're not looking at, that we don't feel like looking at, or, or we kind of don't admit to ourselves, or we're pushing down, and it's usually that. And I don't know why is that. Is that because there's lessons, or we're supposed to learn, or is there some decision up there that's made beforehand that that's how it's going to be? I have no idea. Because uh, no one knows, really. If we say we know, it's not true. No one knows what's going on. But that's what happens with animals. Okay? So that's the cat peepee -pee story. Because <laughs> it enlightens you. So, um, yes. So is it, is it safe to say that if your pet is acting out, um, you should first, first uh, focus in on what they might be Ex calling your attention to within yes, you? Yes, but not necessarily, because it, one has to first look at all the other options. Okay. See, usually, the, I, like I said the, the other day in, in another lecture, I, I spoke about layers. Okay. So there's, and I, I, I gave an example, which I won't repeat, because I already talked about it in, in the other lecture, but I gave an example of cases where there's def, de, different layers. So it could be, one layer could be territorial, for example, that was the case of two cats where it was, um, there was territorial problems because there were other cats coming in from the neighborhood. So the cat was creating a space and his environment. Okay. Then there was f argue, fighting with another cat inside the house, so there was also uh, stress and territorial okay. inside the house. Okay. And then there was below that, the, the last layer was the uh, issue of the relationship of the woman with her husband. Okay. Okay. And the stuff going on in the life of the husband. So there, there can be many layers. Many layers. And I, I usually go down in layers. I start with the superficial. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I, there's a lot of cases like that in the book. But I talk about the first layer, which is the obvious one. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously to be able to go to the do deeper layers, one has to really have that, that ability to do it. But uh, so you won't be doing getting that in a workshop, but you'll be getting plenty because you'll be getting all the first layers and developing the abilities, which is already like one marvelous. Just to be able to do that is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. To be able to communicate with, with an animal. Yeah. It's really, really great. Yes. You have to go, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So um, another thing, well now, now that we're on the subject of cats, I want to start, talk about something I like. Um, so th this, because it just happened, this is a case of a, a woman that I worked with her cat who, who eventually died, and she calls me up, she, she left me an email, and she said, you know, I, I went with my car and I went at this parking place, and there's this black cat who came up, 
And this black cat has been following me ever since. Cute little black cat. And so she found out where the cat was. He had a cat had a collar. Turns out the cat belongs to one of the neighbors. And those neighbors, they really, really love that cat. And they take care of him and they feed him. And they're just like, adore that cat. But the cat, the cat has decided that that cat wants to live with this woman. So the cat comes in the house, goes on her bed, stays with her, and it just wants to live with her and doesn't want to be put out. Mm -hmm. So the neighbors are very upset because <laughs> they think it's their cat. So but I want to, uh, the reason why I'm telling this case is because specifically with cats, uh, we, don't, we really don't, first of all, we don't own an animal. Okay? We're just guardians. We're just, they, they choose. So they choose on different levels. They can choose from above, up before, before they come. I suppose, or they can choose in lifetime, or maybe they've chosen beforehand, and then in the lifetime, one person is just a stepping stone to get to someone else. And sometimes they go, uh, and I'm saying this because I've done a lot of cases of lost animals, especially lost cats, where they, sometimes they just want to go. They just say, I have to be with this person. And usually, in, for example, in this case, it's because that person really needs to be with that cat in that case, because I know that person, I worked with her other cat who died, and she really needs it because she's ill. She's sick and, and she really needs the presence of the cat and the understanding of the cat, and the cat is doing stuff for her in that life. And the other family doesn't really need the cat, even if they like him. And so the cat, on some other level, I'm not saying it's on the conscious level, I'm not saying that, but on some level, somewhere, the cat has decided, I want to be here. And it, it's not necessarily because this place is more comfortable or the food is better. It's not that. It's because there's a decision inside. And that's why uh, for some of you, you might have lost a cat who's gone somewhere else. And that's why I'm as I go back to what I was talking uh, at the beginning, is about respecting the nature of an animal, what they, who they are and what they want and what they really need. And not thinking that we own them, that they belong to us. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Especially if you've paid, the, some people have paid thousands of dollars for their parrot and then he just flies out of the window. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to go somewhere else. <laughs> so it's hard, but we, we really don't own them. They are free and they're free to choose. And they do have free choice. They do have free choice. Um, is that how one says? Libre albedrio. Yeah. They, they, is that the word? Libre albedrio? Where you decide things and you have free choice in your life? Free, freedom of uh, decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a free choice. I think it's the word in English. Yeah. <coughs> and they have that too. It's not because they're animals that they don't have it. They have enough consciousness to have it. And they might not know exactly why, but they still have it. Okay? They have that free choice. So I'm going to talk to you about another case. Which one shall we choose? Um, oh, I know which one. We do canine. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll g I'll give you a case of a dog. We haven't done dogs yet. Um, so dogs, uh, let me think of which one, because I have many that are interesting. Um, I, I'll talk about euthanasia right after. So I'll give you, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about separation anxiety and, uh, and destruction in the homes. Does that speak to anybody? Anyone had a few experiences like that? Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay, again, I have many, many cases, and uh, I tend to forget them once <coughs> they're done. So um, separation anxiety is classic. Now, separation anxiety can come from many reasons. It could be past trauma. It could be because an animal comes from rescue and has had a difficult life before. So all of a sudden, they get, they get with a new person, and then they're anxious when the person leaves. So they, they, they hold on to the person because that person represents safety. Okay? The main thing with animals has to, always has to do with safety. Okay? That's the prime, primary instinct. So a lot of reactions, a lot of problems or behavior have to do with the feeling of lack of safety. So that goes for horses and for cats and for dogs. Okay? It's, it's primary thing. Um, and often people don't understand that, especially in the horse world. They don't understand that things c create a feeling of lack of safety and of danger. And therefore, because they're not in nature and they can't react in a, in a normal way that they would, where they would escape, they would run away, or they would defend themselves, they have weird behavior because they're, 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 their instinct is coming out to protect themselves, which is a safety instinct, okay? And that's, a lot of people don't understand that. That's why communication helps to go to the core issue of what's going on, okay? So this is the case of a, of a dog that's called Kanai. I think I might be talking, 
but he might be in the book. Uh, can I she? Sorry, it's a female. So she now this story really <coughs> mocked me because I got I got the pictures of the house when they would leave, and they sh they filmed it for me. They showed me the pictures, not filmed, but I, they took pictures, and. I swear, if you see those pictures, you would have thought that there was hurricane, I don't know what name, that had gone through the house. Everything was on the floor, the <coughs> chairs upside down, uh, like the pillows opened up, the feathers all over the place, everything chewed up, I mean, just complete disaster, ruin, okay? So that was like an extreme, extreme case, because sometimes, you know, they break down the door, or they chew on a few things, and so it's not great, but it's, it's bearable. But this was not bearable. This was like a, like a war zone, okay? So she was completely desperate. And it's actually a veterinarian who called me, the veterinarian, and she said, the veterinarian said, I'm handing over this case to you because this is a behavioral case. We don't know what's going on. And if this is not going to be better, they might have to euthanize the dog. So I said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll take the case. So I go and I look in there and the first things I get, so again, remember I told you the language comes in pictures, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and all that. I'm getting a lot of tension in the house. So I'm hearing yelling, I'm hearing doors banging, and I'm, I see a younger girl, okay? And I forgot, uh, that I had forgotten to ask who she lived with. I should have asked. Usually I ask. And tons of tension going on in the house, especially a lot of arguing. And I'm thinking, okay, that's not good. Um, so sorry, that's layer two. Layer one, let, let me go back to layer one. Layer one is the dog, when the door closes and they leave, the go dog goes into complete panic attack. Has anyone had a panic attack in this room? You know what it's like? Yeah. It's pretty awful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So anyone who's had a panic attack, um, you, when you see it in an animal, you can recognize it. It's just horrible. It's like you feel as if the space is falling down on you. You feel as if there's no more air, you can't breathe just the panic in the heart and, and this feeling of dying. It's, it's horrible to have a panic attack. So when, what happens to that dog is when the door closes, it goes into a panic attack mode, completely freaks out, starts salivating, freaks out, running around, going in circles, um, tearing at things, just trying to get out. Okay, that's lay, layer one um, of the reaction. So then I go deep and I try to find out why. Why is this panic attack going on? What's happening to this dog? So that's when I get the information about the, the stuff going on in the house, okay? First, second layer. Then I go deeper, like you're swimming, you go deeper. I go deeper and I, what I get is that a lot of rage in, in the heart of the, of the woman, who's the principal guardian, very, very angry. And the information that comes across is anger uh, and it's linked to a man. So I have no idea who this is. Now, some pieces of this information comes from elsewhere. Some stuff comes from the animal but when you go very, very, very deep, some of it can come from elsewhere. And it needs a tremendous amount of discernment and tremendous amount of experience to be certain about what one receives. Because if not, one can make very bad mistakes. That's why when I teach, I'm very careful about what people do and what they say. I'm very, very careful and I teach you, I, I give a lot of attention on the teaching and I make sure that you, you're not going into fantasy and saying stuff because you see, if someone says nonsense in a case like that, it could mean euthanasia for the animal. Especially in Europe. Maybe not in America as much, but in Europe, yes. Um, so you have, one has to be very careful of what one gets and what one says. So, so, so this is what I'm getting. So I, I speak to the woman, and I, I explain to her the feelings of the dog first, and why he, that need also to chew is because of the salivating, and the fact of chewing just calms down the neurological system, calms down and stops all the salivating. Okay? But then I talked to her about the arguing uh, in the home and the door slamming and all that. And she says, well, I have a daughter who is 15 years old <laughs> and we have problems. So they are arguing. She has a teenage daughter in the home and there is, they are slamming doors and there's arguments. Okay? But that's not enough to cause all the stuff that's going on. So then I say, well, but there is something else. <laughs> Can we talk about it? Very careful. I say, is it possible that you could be very angry towards a man who was recently in your life but is not in the, your life anymore. So then she says, oh, my ex-husband. And then she goes off on the ex-husband like she just destroys him, you know. The bastard, blah, 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 he did all this stuff to me, I hate him, oh, she starts ranting. And so I let her rant for a while so she can get it out and then I say, that's what's going on. There's all this rage inside of you 
And because it's not channeled anywhere else and it's not out, it's expressed by the dog. That's what mm -hmm. happened. And that's why the dog is destroying the house. It's as if, now I, I never affirm anything as a complete truth. I say, I think this is what's going on. I never say this is exactly what's going on. I'm not allowed. But I, I tell her, it seems to me that your, ex your outside world is the reflection of your inside world. Because it really is. Okay? Really, really, really. There is no real reality outside. It's really mm -hmm. the reflection of everything going on inside. Mm -hmm. And this is the perfect example. The dog is destroying the place. It's rage. Okay? So she says, oh, I think I get it. <laughs> so I said, well, maybe, maybe you should do some therapy. And maybe you should put the dog somewhere else for a while so that you can get yourself back together. So she decides to put the dog at the house of the parents. And at the house of the parents, the dog behaves impeccably. Nothing. Doesn't even chew a bone practically. Nothing. Perfect behavior. Okay? And then I never hear about this case again until um, t some time later. I, I, I often talk about this case because I've done a lot of destruction home cases. But this one is very, very... Uh, obvious. It's very um, well illustrated. So I, that's why I like using this example. Um, six months later, um, I, someone walks into my workshop. I completely don't recognize. I see a, a woman walking in. And I'm like, oh, hi. I mean, I do get a lot of people over there, so I don't really recognize anyone. But she walks and I, I just didn't recognize her. And she says, well, I'm the woman who came six months ago with the car. Can I? I'm like, oh, yeah. She looks completely different because all of a sudden, this woman is ba radiating light, just happy, balanced. I mean, she looks really good, beautiful woman. Nice, sharp blue eyes. I did not recognize her. So the six months of therapy, she, she just transformed her. So she obviously had a great therapist. And she took the dog back, and that was it. No more mm -hmm. destruction. But she had to work on herself. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's a good case. That's a nice that's case. Yeah. So. Um, to me, I know that maybe animal, other animal communicators don't go into that theme, but to me, I often go into that theme. It doesn't mean that it's always the case. I just did a case of a dog today um, that comes from severe trauma, and that has nothing to do with the people in the home. But, uh, even just to give you that example, this is a dog who is an English bull bulldog, and he comes from a lot of trauma and um, abuse, like beaten and stuff. So this dog has, has dangerous reactions. Um, and the dog is in a foster home pretty much under control. But she, the, the woman told me, well, the last week there's been a few problems. And why? Because there were problems in the home the last week. So it, it triggered something in the dog. But the dog has those issues not having to do with the family. It has those issues from the past. So it's not always like that. It's, um, I'm giving you some examples of some cases. Okay. So that's animal communication. It's great. Very, very mm -hmm. fascinating. And um, I've been doing it for years. And I love every case. Every case is great. Every case is different. Um, and it's just discovering a whole new world with each animal. Question. Yes. Can you have animals that uh, have been rescued, that have been extremely <coughs> abused? In some cases, yes. Some cases, no. So do you work almost like a as a therapist I, I do with healing the for animal? Them. I would do healing. Yeah, because I, I really specialize a lot in healing and I get very, very difficult cases. Um, in Europe, the vets actually are the ones who send me the cases that they can't resolve. In a case like this, I would do healing. Um, I used to refuse those cases and um, now I'm, I'm, I've accepted some, but only under extreme supervision of a trainer or someone because it's too dangerous because you're taking you're putting yourself in a place of danger where the, the animal could be dangerous for a person. Right. And in um, and some cases, you c I've, I've had good results, but I, I have to say it's about 50%, yes, and 50% no. And unfortunately, some had to be euthanized. Mm -hmm. and that, I was the last result. I usually am the last result. They say, well, if you can't do it, then they're going to be euthanized. So it's a, big, it's a horrible responsibility. I don't like it at all, because I feel like I have the life of the animals in my hands. I, re I really don't like that. And, and usually they give me a pressure, also with time. Uh, I, I get a lot of pressure with time. It's really not fair. Like in, in Europe, it's like, well, if the host is not better in a week, we're going to euthanize. I'm like, what? You know, that's not fair. It's, not, it's really because you can't be under pressure when you're doing healing. You, you're connecting. Um, so I have to beg and say, give me three weeks. 
just give me more time, please give me more time. And it's, it's really difficult, a lot of pressure. So those cases, I don't like them because, um, because of the danger. Same as with dangerous horses. I mean, a dangerous horse, I usually refer to someone in, in Switzerland who is like amazing, top specialist in uh, dominant cases. And I say, you have to go to that person. And for example, this is just recently, this was a case that I did, I took six months ago in Switzerland, and very dangerous horse. And I said, well, this is a very prob a big problem. This horse is very, very dangerous. Because of a series of problems, abuse, uh, and you get horses specifically that come from Spain, and they, well, they get to the rest of Europe, they're, they're just disaster because of the way they're treated in Spain, very bad treatment. So Spanish horses usually have a lot of problems. And that horse specifically, I said, this is a very dangerous horse. And I said, as an animal communicator, I'm warning you, this is very dangerous. This is 500 kilos that they can make you fall or they can go back or they, it's dangerous. I said, you have to see that guy. You have to go see him. And, and she didn't go see him. She, and, I, and she called me again after she said, I'm having other problems with the horse. I said, you have to go see that guy. I can't resolve this for you. This is too, too, too dangerous. She didn't go. And then she had a big problem with the horse and she had to sell him. She's not going to solve the problem because selling him, the next person is going to be with the same problem and this usually ends up with euthanasia. Mm -hmm. Which is very, very sad because it's always the animals who pay the price for the, for the, how do you say, bitties, for the mistakes of the human beings. It's always the animals who pay the price. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, but, you know, you do the best you can. You just do the best you can. And I recommend people and sometimes I, if I feel I can help, I even I even will go as far as helping and, and not charging if I feel I can help and they cannot be euthanized. But sometimes I just can't. There's cases that they, they're just really messed up. They've had too much abuse and the whole neurological system is off. So and they're in reactive mode all the time. And so that's the way it is. Sometimes trainers can do it, sometimes they can't. Yeah. yeah. Worked with a lot of rescues so I know. Yeah, I know about those cases too well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, we'll, we'll take a lot of questions after, if you want. So I just want to talk a little bit about euthanasia. Um, so I'm going to talk about the case that I just did with Spain. Just did. Uh, so the dog's name was Kia, and it was with people from Barcelona. Very recent case. So she calls me up and she says, my dog is six months old. And they just found out that my dog has a um, cancer, lymph node cancer, mm -hmm. and has an enormous tumor in the thorax. And basically the vet said, well, there's nothing you can do. That's it. He's going, the dog is going to go. And um, we could do some chemo, but it's not much. It's lymph, lymph cancer. There's not much we can do. So the vet said, you're better off going back home instead of having the dog in the clinic. And if you want, you can continue the chemo, but it's not really going to work and you can go back home and so the dog can, can just go, okay? So she calls me and she asks me, can you do something uh, with healing? So this is a very difficult case, I um, mean, because the cancer is already very, very advanced. Um, so first thing I do is I usually do a communication. In a case like this, I would do a communication and if I feel the animal wants to stay, then I'll say, okay, I'll try healing. If I feel the animal doesn't want to stay, then I'll say, well, I'm not going to try healing because no point but maybe we can assist him so that he can pass in better conditions with that less suffering and, and less trauma and maybe without, without the shot to help them. In many cases we've been able to help them to go naturally at home in the arms of the person without having to go to the clinic and get the shot and all, all the trauma. So I say, okay, so I'll, I'll give it a try. Start working on the dog. Next day, complete miracle. The dog is up. The dog was lying down, not, not eating, not doing anything, completely pro prostrate. What's the word? Um, when I'm in France, I can't remember French. When I'm here, I can't remember English. Um, completely on the on the ground, not not out, not eating, completely not well. And she said he's dying. He's dying. So we're probably going to use euthanize him in, in a few days. So so I start the healing. Next day, miracle. Dog is fine. And from that point on, dog is completely complete transformation. Fine, running, eating, going to the river, uh, swimming in the river. I mean, doesn't even look like he's sick. And I knew it wasn't. I knew it was going to last. I knew that there wasn't so much time. Um, but I was still continuing the healing. 
goes on for two weeks and a half, I think. So they had a wonderful time. They finished, you know, a nice experience with the dog. And then the dog gets liquid and starts getting liquid in, mm -hmm. in the belly. And um, what they had originally said is that they had originally said, we're going to have to euthanize the dog right away because the tumor could explode. And that would be horrible death. Um, but because the dog was doing fine, so we just kept on from day to day. Then the dog got like liquid after two weeks. And so she brought him back to the vet and the vet said, well, we could do a ponction, which means we take out the liquid and um, we, we could do that. Uh, and he would probably continue living. Now, the information that I had is that that dog probably could have stayed maybe a year from the healing. And so I was ready to continue, whatever I had to continue so that the dog could stay alive. But then they went and used, so there was a problem with emails. There was a problem with emails and I didn't see the email they, they, because Gmail goes all the way under. And I didn't manage to get in touch with them and it was on a weekend. And they went and they euthanized the dog without asking me, without telling me. And so we get to Tuesday, I think, Monday or Tuesday, and she said, well, we've already did the euthanasia. And I said, well, why? Why did you do it? And she said, well, because the dog was doing really well, and then he just got that little thing in the liquid, and we thought that it was better to euthanize him while he was well than getting really sick. Mm. Yeah. And I felt, well, no. I felt, he, why would you euthanize him if he's doing really well and he's happy? I don't get it, because I wouldn't have done it. So, so then I did the communication um, with the deceased dog, which was uh, yesterday. And, and so in the communication, he said, the Kia said, so, uh, said, well, I could, have, I could have stayed longer, but it's okay. Because I wasn't supposed to stay for long, and I came to be in the life of the boyfriend. So that completely took me by surprise, because I thought that the dog was the dog of the woman, that I was, I was dealing with her, the Spanish woman. I never even talked to the boyfriend. I didn't even, I barely knew that there was, a, she mentioned at one point, we, we. So I figured, well, she's probably living with someone. But he said, I'm, I'm there for the boyfriend, and I wasn't supposed to stay very long anyhow. But I could have stayed much longer. But it's okay if they let me go now. It's okay. No judgment. There's never any judgment. And so, and then what was interesting is that the dog also gave me information, and he talked about the brother. And he said, the brother of the woman. And so I thought, well, maybe the brother of the woman is passed. I was completely confused. He said, he talked about the brother of the woman, that he had messages uh, for the brother of the woman and saying, it's okay, you can let go, don't, don't worry, let, you can let go. And don't worry, and it's finished, and stuff like that. And like, what? What is this all about? And I thought, well, maybe she has a brother who's dead. So I go and I, 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 I talk to her. So first we talk about the situation with the boyfriend. And, and she says, well, yes. Actually, I was the one talking with you on the phone, but actually he's the dog of the boyfriend. The boyfriend is the one who chose him, and he wanted his own dog. And so he's actually the dog of the boyfriend. And there was also information for the boyfriend about his dad and about tons of things that I won't go into now. It's not, not important. But that were important for him, for, 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 the, for the boyfriend. And that was given to the dog on, on, in another dimension. And then the funny, uh, not funny, I mean, I find it funny, but it's not funny, <laughs> the thing about the brother, was because the brother, it wasn't the brother who passed. The brother was alive, but he, he was in his 20s, and he had a best friend who, who died um, very young, who committed suicide. And the best friend was 20 when he committed suicide, or 21. And what he did is that just before committing suicide, he went to the house of the brother, who was his best friend. And the, best, the brother wasn't there. So he went and he committed suicide. He threw himself in the front of a train. And the brother has the guilt because he mm -hmm. feels that if he had been there, the brother of the girl, mm -hmm. he would have stopped him from committing suicide. And that was the message from, from above, to let go. Mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I saw, I saw the figure of a young man, but I, th I thought it was the brother, because I kept hearing brother. So. Um, that's about another story about euthanasia. I have a few different ones. And uh, um, I think that euthanasia is always a, it's a very, very delicate uh, question. And communication helps you to know if it's right. I mean, we know when to say something is right or wrong. It's the choice of the animal, really, with, with the creator. 
But unfortunately, they don't have free choice, their animals, because we decide. We say, okay, well, you, now it's time we're going to put the shot. But sometimes they're not ready, even if they're really sick, even if the vet says they have to go. And sometimes they're not ready. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's very, very, um, it's a fine line when it comes to euthanasia. Because we have, we kind of have free choice. I mean, we die, we just die. <coughs> the soul says, our spirit just goes. But with an animal, we, we impose it on them because we, we give the shot. So unless they die of a natural death, what that is, could be a spirit choice, a choice of the spirit too, an accident or something like that. Sometimes they do choose to live like that. They, 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 their free choice is eliminated. Whereas in a non-domesticated uh, situation, they still have free choice, and you know, because of course they can be eaten by another animal, but that's part of their destiny. So that's the way. That's euthanasia. Questions? Yes. Um, so then, with the if the dog was ready, would the dog just let you know? I mean, if, if you're you know if you're open to listening yes, to that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now this mm -hmm. is also delicate because you see, there's been a lot of animals who've died because people, uh, students, which now are very strict with students, but not only my students, students of other people. And they say nonsense. They say, oh, well, he's ready to go. Oh, he's an old soul. Oh, he told me he wanted to die. Oh, he told me he, was, he wanted to commit suicide. I'm like, what? Excuse me, animals don't speak like that. Animals, they don't speak like that. And they don't tell you uh, cosmic things about 2012. I know I repeat this all the time. They don't talk like that. They're very, animals are animals. So I, well, we have no right to say ready or not ready. We, as a communicator, I can suggest, I can say, I have a feeling that's kind of getting ready. Uh, or I have a feeling that he wants to stay. But then I say, you're the one who really knows in your heart because you're the guardian and you're the one who's connected to the animal in your heart and you're the one who deep down really, really knows the truth. I can just guide you in this. But I have no right to affirm anything as a complete, absolute truth. <coughs> but I can say, what I can say is from experience in the past, I have had a ton of cases where I have said ready or not ready, I, that's how I feel, and the animal waited the exact time that I said before they passed, or they waited for the guardian to be ready, because usually it's because the person is not ready, and usually it's because the person is afraid of death, because animals are not afraid of death. They accept it, it's part of the natural thing, for them it's something normal. We're the ones who are afraid of death, and void and all that stuff. So sometimes they wait, they wait for the person to be ready, and they can be incredibly sick, and that's why the vet says they have to have the shot. Now, the vet is right. Point of view of the vet is right. But point of view animal communication is a little bit different. The point of view is of the vet is we have to avoid suffering at all costs, so they, they are right when they say that. But the spirit might say otherwise. Because the spirit might say, because two days or three days can make an enormous difference for the person to be ready. You see? I mean, I, we even have a case um, this is a, one of my dogs, was my, one of the family dog, when I used to live with my ex-husband. And, um, and he, he had osteosarcoma. So he, was, he, was, uh, he lived until 16 or 17 years old. He was never, ever sick. The only thing he had was a ligament thing that, that I worked on. It was the only thing he ever had in his whole life. But then at the end of his life, he got osteosarcoma. So the, the vet said, well, there's not much time left. And uh, we, he was on cortisone. And I just figured, well, we'll know when, he, when he's ready. And so um, I, I, I kept doing communications, and he was just not ready. And there was also the other dog, which is the one that's still with me. And she was very connected to him, very close to him. So he was staying for the other dog, but he was also staying for my ex-husband, because he was living with him. I was, I, was, I was not living with the dog anymore. I was living in Europe. I was in Europe and, and here, but I wasn't with the dog. He was really there for my ex-husband. And so I kept saying, no, he's not ready. He needs, he, there's more time. He just needs more time. Why? I, I don't know, but that's what he needs. And, and my ex-husband would say, well, yeah, I, that's how I feel. You see, because really the person knows inside. That's what I could try to make you understand. You really know inside your heart. Your heart knows everything. Okay? And so then finally one day he calls me. I was in France. And he says, I'm going to do the euthanasia on Thursday because I know he's ready now. I just feel, I know it. And I, I'm ready too. He says, I'll do the euthanasia on Thursday. I'm going to have the vet come to the house, and we're going to do it. And we're, we're all ready. Okay? And so the dog died Wednesday night. Because <laughs> wow. he, he knew. He knew. He just knew. He was waiting for him. 
he was he was ready. He would have gone ages ago. He waited for him, and often they do that. I have so many, many cases like that where they, they just they wait. They wait for the right moment. Sometimes, like I had a case in, in France not so long ago, tiny, cute, cute, Siamese cat, really cute. And the cat was really sick. I forgot where it was now. I um, can't remember the, which one. I remember the case, but I can't remember the illness that that cat had. But anyhow, the vet said, that's it. Yeah, the cat has to have euthanasia. Um, he's, he's really not well. And in the communication, I said, no cat is not quite ready and it, it's about the husband the woman fine finally enough usually the woman isn't ready <laughs> but there was the husband the cat was very important for the for the husband so she said well yes it's true because my husband is out of town and so we're going to wait I, 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 after I did the communication she said yeah and he, he's really very very close to the cat so we're going to wait for my husband to come back and I said okay so I'll help you we'll do healing so I can help you so she, so they didn't do euthanasia. They waited for the husband to come back. The husband came back to in town, and I can't remember. It was over the weekend, and he had the whole of Friday, and then the Saturday the cat died peacefully on his own, on its own. Just left, and he he was ready to leave earlier. But he the cat. They, you see, when I did the communication, there was this anxiety. There's this feeling. I can I can feel it. No, it's not. I can't go yet. I can't go yet. Something holding them back. And it was this anxiety that had to do with the husband. He wanted the husband to be there with him so he could leave. So everything was finished with, with peace and harmony. And that's how it was. So <coughs> a lot of animals have the ability to go on their own. And they have their own group of spirits that comes and helps them to go. But it's, usually it's for us that they, some cases no. Yes? Do, do you see that working in the opposite direction at all? Where animals support the transition of humans? I have, have had less of those, okay. but yes, I have, I've had a few of those, yes. Okay. That they How's stay that there. They stay there. Uh, you mean, that, that means the animal would stay for the, uh, so the person can leave. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have had I've, very few. I, must have, I might have had two, about three of those cases, okay. which I can't quite remember now, but the one was a bird, actually, which is in the story, in the book stories in the book and the bird died right after the woman died and uh, and and cases where